Hello everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for the Northwest Data Science Summit. My name is Katherine Kuhn and I'm from the University of Washington in Seattle in the School of Forestry and Environmental Sciences. And I'm excited to talk to you today about my research in Arctic and Boreal Lake Greening. As you've likely seen in the news, high northern latitudes hold massive amounts of ancient organic carbon that's at risk from thaw. This carbon is locked up in these frozen soils called permafrost. And this photo is showing you an example of permafrost thaw happening near Teshapuk Lake in Alaska. The frozen permafrost soils hold massive amounts of ancient organic carbon. In fact, they're estimated to possess between 13 and 1500 petagrams of carbon that's been so far cryogenically preserved in the frozen permafrost soils. However, these soils are warming as Arctic regions are warming from climate change. In fact, Arctic regions have been shown to be warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet. The warming is predicted to liberate this previously locked up carbon, where it can be released into the atmosphere as greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and methane, further amplifying the greenhouse effect and accelerating climate change. In contrast to this trend, however, increased primary productivity has been observed in circumpolar terrestrial ecosystems in the past half century. So this figure is actually showing the distribution of plant growth change across the Arctic and boreal regions. And this plant growth is called greening. Scientists think that greening is driven by a process called CO2 fertilization, where more carbon dioxide is available for plants to convert into biomass. And the greening is also driven by the longer and warmer growing seasons. Basically, as the Arctic and boreal regions warm up, plants are trying to keep up. However, it's complex. New studies have also shown browning trends from fires, drought, and insect invasions. And the balance of greening versus browning in these regions has really important ecosystems for global carbon budgets because the rate at which the plants can store the carbon uh, as biomass acts as an offset to the rate at which the carbon is being released from the frozen permafrost soils. All of these greening and browning trends have been inferred from satellite remote sensing observations. And scientists use satellite remote sensing to build models to map greening and browning trends in these vast and remote areas. However, so far to date, one key component has been missing from this picture, and that is that there have been no Pan-Arctic satellite surveys yet to understand changes in lake color. Why would we care about lake color? Well, lakes and ponds are actually abundant in Arctic and Boreal regions, and they provide many key ecosystem services. So there's estimated to be somewhere around 3.5 million lakes above 65 degrees north. And this satellite scene shown here in the background actually depicts how lake rich these high northern latitudes can be. This is a planet scope CubeSat image taken over the Arctic coast of Siberia in August 2019. And as you can see, there are hundreds and thousands of lakes scattered across these northern regions. These lakes provide many key ecosystem services, including wildlife habitat. They affect surface albedo, which in turn impacts the Earth's energy budget. Lake water quality is really important for sustaining the human communities in these landscapes. And lake nutrients and water provide the backbone for aquatic food webs that support fish and many other species that rely on them. And finally, lakes are increasingly being recognized as important players in global carbon cycles, as they can be significant emitters of carbon dioxide and methane. So, these lakes are providing many important ecosystem services, but it's very difficult to monitor them because there are so many of them and they are, this, these regions are very vast and remote. One tool that we have to try to understand lake dynamics is actually lake color. And lake color may help reveal many important ecological processes. In particular, scientists can use satellite observations of greening and browning of water to try to understand some of the changes that are happening in these landscapes. So from space, lakes have been observed to be greening. An example of that is this MODIS satellite scene taken over Lake Erie on September 11th that's showing a massive intense algal bloom. And in contrast, on the right, 
Lake Browning has also been observed in permafrost landscapes where the frozen permafrost soils begin to thaw and all the organic carbon that was locked in them begins to leach into the lakes, turning the lakes brown. And this browning can have a lot of really important ecological implications that we'll talk about later. However, most of the studies of greening and browning to date have been conducted in really large lakes or they've been conducted at the field scale from field studies. And because of the importance of lake color in helping us identify these trends, lake color has actually recently been designated as an essential climate variable. So the basic idea, the premise of a lot of this research is that lake color can be used as a proxy for fundamental ecological processes and for lake chemistry. And in some of my earlier research, I actually had success translating water color to water chemistry in a study I did mapping river water quality. And what I did is I built a workflow that used satellite imagery to successfully map water quality, including turbidity and chlorophyll A, in three major rivers, the Columbia, the Mississippi, and the Amazon. And the results were published in the Remote Sensing of the Environment, and they showed that it's feasible to map water quality from newer high-resolution satellites that include Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2. So the major difference here is that previously satellites were not able to see things as small as rivers and lakes. But as satellite remote sensing has advanced, there are more and more sensors available that can see at the fine spatial resolution that is required in order to begin to develop some of these algorithms for mapping water quality in smaller water bodies like lakes and rivers. And this study really sparked for me a desire to start to try to apply these workflows to other types of ecosystems. And this led me to my current research, which I'm conducting as part of NASA's Arctic Embryal Vulnerability Experiment, or the ABUB project. The ABUB project is a 10-year field and airborne study whose major goal is to try to characterize the effects of climate change in Arctic embryo ecosystems and communities. And as part of this research, my specific study is exploring how lake color relates to the lake primary production. I'm also interested in quantifying temporal trends in lake color. And finally, I want to evaluate the spatial patterns and processes of lake color trends across these landscapes. And the ABUB project is occurring predominantly in the Arctic and Boreal regions of North America, which you can see the study region in this map above on the right. So as part of the above project, it is really important that we collect field validation data in order to validate the models we make from airborne and satellite remote sensing. And so one of my favorite parts about my work is that we get to go up to the lakes and sample a whole variety of different parameters. And I've had um, the good fortune of being able to go up for the past few years and conduct field research in Canada and Alaska as part of a much larger team that is the NASA ABUB project. And we collect a huge variety of measurements, including surface reflectance, optical properties of the water. We collect isotopes to help understand the age of the carbon that's cycling in these ecosystems. We also directly measure carbon fluxes, and we take a suite of basic water quality measurements as well. And because we're doing this as part of the ABUB project, we often get to be in the field with many collaborators who are collecting many other different types of data. Another really cool part of the ABUB project is that while we're in the field, NASA coordinates airborne campaigns. And so coincident to the days that we're out there, they will often fly airborne sensors over us to collect hyperspectral data. And we can then relate this airborne data to satellite remote sensing data and validate models that we build with the field measurements that we've captured while we're in the field. One of the really important things that we've discovered through our field research is that lakes act as important carbon pumps on this landscape. So the previous hypothesis that science held, scientists held was that lakes are cycling a lot of this ancient organic carbon that's found in the frozen permafrost soils. But in our research in the Yukon Flats of Alaska, we actually figured out that these lakes are not cycling, there's no evidence that they're cycling ancient organic carbon. In fact, what they're doing is the phytoplankton and plants in the lakes are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and cycling it internally, re-releasing it as carbon dioxide and methane. And we know this because we can directly measure the amount of carbon dioxide and methane that's being taken up or released. And the photo on the right is showing us in the field and two of my USGS collaborators are holding a chamber over the lake and directly measuring the amount of carbon dioxide and methane that's being released. We can also collect 
isotopes to understand the rate at which photosynthesis is occurring. And so the photo on the left is showing you some vials that we collect that we use to measure this gross rate of photosynthesis, also known as gross primary production. And that can give us a clue into how much carbon is being cycled through these lakes. One of the first findings that we discovered when we started to look at the airborne data was actually that lake color can help reveal lake function. So using satellite and airborne data, we actually made a really interesting discovery. What this figure is showing you on the left is we found a relationship in between gross primary production as we measured in the field from oxygen isotopes and lake color, which is on the x-axis. And lake color in particular as measured from Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 in the green band. And so this scatter plot is showing you that we actually discovered a relationship in between how green the lakes look from space and how much photosynthesis is happening in them. And this is a really novel finding and it is really exciting because it allows us to take this relationship that we discovered and apply it on a pixel by pixel basis back to the satellite imagery to start to build these spatially explicit maps of gross primary productivity estimated from satellite remote sensing observations. And so the maps on the right are showing you these GPP maps that we can build from satellite remote sensing imagery. And the reason why this is really important is because, as I said before, these landscapes are vast and remote. It's expensive and really hard to do field work in them. And so satellite remote sensing is an important tool that we can have to provide us with observations across the entire region. And when we can start to find these relationships, we can use them to build maps of the landscapes that we're studying to help extend our understanding of the trends across a broader region. The other thing that's really exciting about this finding is that so far, there's been many studies where people map gross primary production in oceans and in larger lakes, but it's very, very um, few studies have been conducted in smaller lakes. And so this is a really novel result that has a lot of exciting promise um, for future work. So, from this research, these studies combined, we can start to kind of convince ourselves that lake color actually can provide important clues for into lake ecological processes. However, the next question that I'm really interested in is how is lake color changing over time? And actually, there's a really cool tool available at our fingertips for tracking lake color through time, and that is NASA's Landsat sensor. So Landsat has been around since the mid 80s and it is a sun synchronous satellite that orbits around the earth and has been collecting global observations of the planet for decades. And actually over the above domain, there is quite a bit of Landsat data available. And so this figure is showing you how many scenes are collected every month since 1984 in the study area that we saw the map of earlier. And from 1984 to 2019, there's actually been a little shy of 300,000 Landsat scenes that have been collected. And this is a non-trivial amount of data. Uh, one scene is 3 billion bytes. And we looked at about half a million lakes. In total, we have 53 million individual glimpses or Landsat observations of those lakes. This results in about 133 terabytes of data. So it's not a obscene amount of data, but I certainly for this project did not want to have to buy 133 one terabyte hard drives to process all of this data. So I was very lucky earlier on in my research to be exposed to some exciting new tools for rapid cloud-based spatial analytics. And those two tools are Google Earth Engine, the Google Earth Engine platform, and the Python stack. Google Earth Engine is a cloud-based platform for geospatial analysis. And one thing that's really cool about it is it has co-located Earth observation data like the Landsat archive in the same place as a lot of other data sets like terrain data and climate reanalysis data. So it makes it really easy to go build workflows with many different data sets in the cloud and do rapid pixel-based operations. And then finally, the Python stack, which many of you are probably very familiar with, is just an excellent series of tools for statistical analysis and visualization. So using these two, two different sets of tools, I developed a scalable workflow in which we take the Landsat collection, we filter to quality data, we calculate growing season greenness for each lake for each year, and then we analyze the slope of that trend. And I'm happy to talk more in the questions about this figure, but I don't want to go into too much detail now. But in short, the data sets that we use are in blue, the Google Earth Engine operations are in green, and then the operations that we conducted in Python or QGIS are in yellow or orange. 
And this, the thing that's really exciting about this workflow is that you can give this workflow any pixel coordinates and be able to pull out this time series of color for that area throughout the entire Landsat archive. So what we're able to do is we start to develop these uh, time series of lake color. This is a Landsat natural color time series showing one of the study areas that we visit a lot in the Yukon Flats. And what you can see is the stack of Landsat observations over time. And if you observe the natural color scenes of these lakes, you can see that they change not only a lot in their surface area as they expand and contract, but their color also changes as algal blooms flicker on and off across, across the time series. So using these time series, remember the original question that we wanted to answer was, how has lake color changed through time? What we actually discovered in our analysis of about a half million lakes is we discovered widespread declines in lake greenness. And so using all of the lakes in the above domain, which are shown in pink on this gray map in the inset, we actually calculated and found out that about 26% of lakes showed significant changes in color and greenness from 1984 to 2019. And of those lakes with statistically significant color changes, 97% of them are less green. We can also use this map to help identify hot spots of rapid change. And some areas that stand out in particular are the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta and the Queen Maud Gulf. And these area, this map can help us identify and pinpoint places where rapid change is happening in order to target new field campaign efforts. So not only are we able to see the overall trend and magnitude of this change in lake color, but we also want to understand what is driving the trend. So in order to tease out some of the controls, we did an analysis of climate reanalysis data, the ERA-5 Copernicus data set, and we calculated changes in temperature and precipitation over the steady area for the growing season. And what we found is that 63% of the lakes are located in warmer and wetter basins. So overall, most of the lakes are in regions that are getting warmer and wetter. And lakes in warmer and wetter basins had 2.5 times greater declines in greenness. So this is really interesting. Places where the landscape is warming and thawing, lakes have steeper declines in color. And this is actually consistent with model projections from another study that was conducted in Fennoscandia, which is Norway, Sweden, and Finland, that showed accelerated aquatic browning in a wetter climate. So in this figure, what it's basically showing is that as precipitation increases and as landscapes get wetter, more organic carbon is leaking out from the soils into aquatic ecosystems. And this um, is called aquatic browning. And they predicted a 30 to 50% increase in organic carbon concentrations under a wetting climate for the Fennoscandia region. This aquatic browning has really important implications for ecosystems. A browner lake has warmer water temperatures. It has more depleted oxygen. And the organic carbon can absorb light that in turn shades out primary producers. So this is really key because the shading that can happen from aquatic browning can reduce the amount of photosynthesis and that in turn can affect the amount of carbon dioxide being taken up by the e ecosystem and it can affect the greenhouse gas emissions of the water body. So it can alter the amount of methane and carbon dioxide that is released from these lakes. And so lake browning is really a critical change that's happening in these landscapes. And this study can help us pinpoint areas where this, this change is happening more rapidly. So in this study, we created scalable workflows for the spectral analysis of water bodies. And we established a new satellite proxy for Lake GPP from field airborne and satellite measurements. We also compiled 54 million observations of lake color for about half a million lakes from 1984 to 2019 in the above domain. And we found significant changes in color in 26% of the lakes, and the greatest declines were in warmer and wetter basins. Finally, we identified primary controls on lake color and hot spots of change. However, I do wanna say that this is not standalone evidence. Field studies are still needed. So these satellite observations can help us pinpoint areas of rapid change, but it is still really important that we go out in the field and take field measurements in order to validate the models that we're building from airborne and remote sensing data 
to try to understand what might be making these lakes more green or less green and the different processes that are controlling these color trends across the landscape. So with that, I just want to thank my collaborators. Over the years, I've had the good fortune of working with so many great people from the USGS and NASA and people who are involved in the above campaign. And finally, also, I would like to thank Google Earth Engine for making its platform available for use for us and also the folks at eScience who have been um, really foundational in, in the development of a lot of this work. So thank you so much for listening and I look forward to taking questions during the Q&A.